Here I go, here I go, here I go again. Girls, what's my weakness? Sun, okay then. Hey everybody, welcome back. It's Paige uh, from the Helen Schuller Nature Center. Today, we're talking about the sun, which is why I'm here in my bathroom. I'm gonna put on a little sun protection because sometimes you need it. Anyway, stick around. Let's talk about the sun. It's the Natural Leaders Project Home Eco Challenge. All right, you guys, so this week we're talking all about sunlight. And so in order to do that, let's start right at the source. Let's talk about the sun. You know, the sun, that th right there, right? See, you can see, oh, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Never mind. don't look at the sun. That'd be very dangerous. Very foolish. We don't want to do that. Don't look at the sun. You'll burn your eyes right out. And that's because the sun is very, very powerful. The sun is actually extremely powerful, and so is the sunlight that comes flying out of it. Uh, the mighty golden sun is, in fact, a star at the center of our solar system, um, and it's not actually solid. It's made up of these like glowing, burning gases like hydrogen and uh, helium. The sun is super duper huge, so much so that it actually has its own gravitational force. This means that all of the planets in our solar system, including Earth, of course, are sucked into the gravitational pull um, and they all spin in an endless rotation around the sun. On top of all of that, this sun is so powerful that the energy that shoots forth from this star provides the heat and light that energizes all life on Earth. Whoa. No big deal. Just, you know, a source of energy for all life or whatever. <laughs> Ooh. So now our star, the sun, is just one of many, many, many stars actually in our galaxy, which is called the Milky Way. And the universe is made up of countless galaxies, which are all made up of countless stars and then countless solar systems around those stars. And then you have all this other crazy stuff in there like black holes and I could really, really get off track here. So let's reel it in, Paige. Back to Earth. So the sun shoots out these little balls of energy called photons. That's photon, P-H-O-T-O-N. So photons are these little balls of light and heat energy that come shooting out of the sun and fling it across the solar system and then come hurtling through our atmosphere in a blaze of glory! Huzzah! So once it enters into our atmosphere, it smacks into tons of stuff. Some of those, th those things, like ice and water, actually reflect a lot of that sunlight, whereas other things like grass and cement and, well my nose, absorb quite a bit of that sunlight. So at some point, the energy from that photon or the light is transferred into the object it is absorbed into um, or into the object that it hits. So causing that object to warm up or in some other way be changed by this new additional energy. So one important thing to note about sunlight, these photons, is that they are both like little balls of energy, but you can also think of them like waves of energy, kind of like little spag spaghetti noodles of energy that are wiggle jiggle in their way from the sun to the surface of the planet. But you can also look at sunlight waves as actually little balls or particles um, that are kind of shooting like a tennis ball across uh, the atmosphere and into, into our planet. So I've explained that photons are like little balls of energy, but they're also like little spaghetti noodles or waves of energy, and that's because they're both. Scientists are actually currently quite bamboozled by the idea of what photons are, like what actually is sunlight. Is it a particle? Is it a wave? So, so far, we're just going with both. <laughs> it's both. It's simultaneously a wave, like a, a wave of sunlight, um, but it's also like a little ball, like a little ball of sunlight. So currently we call them kind of like wave particles or particle waves because they're both a ball and a wave at the same time. Wow, wild. Now these particle waves are made up of tons of different wavelengths of light um, or types of light and we call that the visible light spectrum. And so that is the light that we see around us. And everything that we see um, is actually just that sunlight reflecting off of that object and 
smacking us in the eyeball. I know that my house is here because as the sunlight is bouncing off of the siding of my house, that the sunlight comes over to my eyeballs and it kind of transmits the image of whatever it bounced off of into my eyes. Isn't that crazy? Ah, oh, eyeballs are crazy. Fascinating stuff. So what are these little particle waves? Well, they're energy. Now there are lots of different kinds of energy. Um, you could have motion energy, um, you could have light energy, heat energy, even stored energy, which is energy that's kind of like waiting to be used and expressed. Now, sunlight, I think we can all agree, uh, is a combination of light and heat energy. That's why it's both light um, and it carries with it heat, which is why you can fry a side, an egg on a sidewalk on a really hot day. So sunlight energy also looks a little different depending on your perspective. For example, different kinds of eyeballs can perceive light in different ways. You see, human eyes see electromagnetic radiation, which is also known as the visible light spectrum. That means that when we look at this flower, for example, the light that is reflected off of that flower places this image in our minds. Bumblebees, however, see ultraviolet light, which means that some additional forms of light is reflected off of the surface of, for example, the same kind of flower, and it looks like this. The pollen looks like glitter, folks. Now tell me, why do you think it's important that a bumblebee would see pollen kind of like glitter? Now plants, I mean, who knows how they perceive light? They don't have any eyeballs. Now we can make guesses about how these organisms perceive light, um, but our guesses are limited by our imaginations. I mean, we know a few things, like plants can actually move uh, their stems and branches and things like that towards light. They have these proteins um, that sense light, um, but it's a, it's a totally different perspective and interpretation of sunlight. So my question is, how do you think plants perceive sunlight? Hmm. So your first assignment is to go to your sit spot, close your eyes and lay in the grass or on the ground or in a chair, whatever, and try to imagine how plants perceive light without eyeballs. So the objective is to try to stay in as much sunlight as possible. So how can you move across the ground without moving your feet? Because remember, plants are rooted in place, so they can't like relocate. But they can stretch their um, stretch themselves in different directions. So they can send out like blades or branches or um, stems. All these things they can move. Um, actually, plants have these uh, photo like light sensing proteins um, that allow them to actually perceive sunlight and heat and warmth. Um, and so they will actually grow in the direction of sunlight. So when you're done perceiving light as though you are a plant, I want you to actually um, find some way of drawing or describing what you think a plant, or how you think a plant perceives sunlight. What does sunlight feel like to a plant or look like to a plant? Can you find some like interpretive way of drawing that? So that's your challenge. All right, so we've talked a little bit about what, uh, what, 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 okay, so we've talked a little bit about what sunlight is, and now we're gonna talk about how we use sunlight. Okay, big whoop. So the sun is like the source of all energy on our planet, and you know, it's why we're even sitting here, because it keeps our planet in gravitational pull, blah, blah, blah. Big whoop. <laughs> how else do we use sun? So I want you to try to come up with, your second activity is to come up with 10 different things that you use the sun for on a daily basis. Okay, so what are 10 different ways that you use the sun? That's your second activity. So we use the sun in tons of different ways. It's super duper important um, for our everyday lives. Now there are a couple of things that I'll talk about that we use the sun for. The first is tracking time. The earth spins one full rotation every 24 hours and that's obviously what makes day and night. So when our area of land, so the place that we live here in Blackfoot Territory, is facing the sun, it's daytime. And then as the earth continues to spin away from the sun, it becomes, well, nighttime. The sun spins clockwise, which is why the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. So we humans love to categorize things. So a couple hundred years ago, we created this little fancy piece of technology called a clock to tell us, well, what the sun is telling us with as much precision as possible. 
Now, before clocks were invented, sundials were actually used as one early method for monitoring time. A sundial is an object stuck in the ground that casts a moving shadow, um, which follows the movement of the sun. So, of course, as we talked about, the Earth is spinning around once every day, which makes it day and night. But while the Earth is spinning around, it's also moving in a full rotation around the sun itself. So one turn around the, one turn around the sun takes 365 days, which makes up a year. So the Earth has two rotations going on here, people. It has a daily rotation and a yearly rotation. The Earth is also tilted. It's not straight up and down. So throughout the year, different parts of the Earth receive the sun's most direct rays. And this is what actually causes seasons. So when the North Pole like tilts towards the sun, it's summer here in Canada. And when the South Pole tilts towards the sun, it's winter here in Canada. Um, this means that sundials need to be calibrated based on the season. Um, but that's more complex than we're getting into. So your third assignment is to create a sundial from your home and calibrate it to the current season. So make marks around the sundial at different hours of the day to see if you can actually learn to read a sundial. Super cool. I also recommend that you recalibrate the sundial as we approach the summer solstice, which is June 20th. Um, and then after the solstice to see if you can kind of like recalibrate um, it on your own. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. Another way that we use the sun is actually uh, to disinfect or to bleach different objects. So the sun is a natural disinfectant because sunlight is so powerful. It can actually be quite damaging to any organisms that are not adapted to this extreme form of energy. For example, certain plants like cactus, and this is a picture of a prickly pear cactus, have adaptations that actually help them survive intense, intense sunlight on a hot, dry, say, south-facing coulee slope, like in this picture. Now, little itty-bitty bacteria often don't have adaptations that protect them from sunlight. So actually, some bacteria become vulnerable and like incapable of reproduction in certain wavelengths of sunlight, like ultraviolet light. And that's why we use uh, UV light to disinfect water. This means that when you put something that, say, doesn't have a special protective component outside in the sun, it actually begins to fade. And this is called sun bleaching. That's often why UV blockers are added to things like exterior paints or outdoor equipment and other kind of manufactured items to help those things keep their color. This is also what makes clothing lines excellent for drying white sheets and clothing. So your fourth assignment is to complete a sun bleaching experiment. Woohoo! Now this is also one of those bingo squares. So when you complete it, you can scratch that off. Uh, basically, I want you to find some things around your home made from various materials that you'd like to try sun bleaching. So set these things outside in a really sunny place for, you know, at least a day to see what the sun does to them. Um, cover part of the object to see kind of what the difference is, or maybe take before or after photos, or maybe you have two things that you can compare um, that start out looking the same. Things like construction paper work really well if you have any like stained white t-shirts or socks or something like that. Wood, maybe try something plastic. Try a couple of different materials and see what you get. It's actually, it's not as sunny as it was earlier, so I'm going to have to uh, <laughs> relocate. It's actually even starting to rain. But anyway, I'm really excited. I'm actually going to, I'm actually thinking about putting a clothesline up, uh, to take my sun bleaching experiment to the next level, you know? Uh, I have a lot of dirty towels. But anyway, the point is, I am uh, actually really excited to do my own little sun bleaching experiments. Um, but the third thing that I kind of wanted to talk about today obviously is how we use the sun for energy and I don't just mean um food you know because either everything that we eat is either a plant or an animal that eats plants and those plants eat well the sun so essentially we're it all comes back to us actually consuming the sun in some form of energy uh through plants and animals which is really cool um but also I want to talk about I also want to talk about energy in terms of actual like electrical energy um, and all of the different forms of electricity and energy that actually come directly from the sun. So the sun is the source of all energy on our planet. As I said, all food comes from sunlight. Basically, the plantos convert the sunlight into food and then the consumers eat the plants and so on and so forth. Now these days, often when we think about energy though, we're really thinking about electricity. 
the energy that powers, you know, the device that you're watching this on or your air conditioner or your phone or your car. So all of those forms of energy are also tied in some way to the sun. Now, obviously, we have fossil fuels, which are three fuels that come in a solid, liquid, and a gas state. Now, those are coal, oil, and natural gas. Now, fossil fuels are actually the decayed remains of plants and animals and various bacteria from hundreds of millions of years ago. Now, we get energy from these things by burning them. In other words, they are forms of combustion energy because to combust is to burn. Now, when we burn fossil fuels, we're simply releasing sunlight that was trapped in these decaying organisms from millions and millions and millions and millions of years ago. Now, there are other ways of creating electricity, um, including geothermal technology, that's heat from the earth. Um, there's hydroelectricity, there's wind electricity, like we talked about last week. And of course, electric electricity generated by solar technology, solar panels. Now, I've linked an amazing video in the description box below. It's by Richard Comp, and it's a TED Ed video all about how solar panels work. Now, your last assignment is to watch that video. Um, and if you're up to it, I'd also recommend making yourself a little pro and con list uh, for solar energy. Um, keep in mind that video is like at least six years old. So solar technology has come a long way since then. Um, but basically, there's with all forms of energy, there are pros and cons. There's no one perfect form of energy. So make sure that you kind of think critically about some of the limitations and some of the opportunities, the boundless opportunities with solar technology. Okay, you guys, that's it for this week. Thanks for coming on this little sun journey with me. Um, so without further ado, there is going to be no uh, video or program next week because it will be the May long weekend week, May break spring break or whatever so uh, you'll have the week off to do whatever you please and I hope you get outside and have a lot of fun uh, thank you so much and I'll see you guys next time bye